So our first afternoon session is moving on to consideration of accessibility in the built environment. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Terry Maloney, who's going to chair this session. She's a recognized international executive and authority specializing in human resources, recruitment and retention, leadership and culture and organizational change. Her specialist areas include strategy, future of work, culture and values, and equality and inclusion. She's the head of the employee success team in Salesforce, and she's also currently the chairperson of the Dublin Regional Skills Forum. So Terry, the floor is yours. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back from lunch. As um, you said, my name is Terry, and it's an absolute honor to be here today at this conference to introduce a group of amazing speakers. Our theme for the session is accessibility of the built environment. For those of you who have visual impairment, I am a uh, white female. I have actually just retired from Salesforce, um, so that'll give you a sense of my age. Um, and um, I'm wearing a wine trouser suit. So uh, yeah, hopefully that'll give you some sense of who's on the stage. So uh, accessibility of the built environment, actually, you know, surprising a HR leader um, having such passion about something like that. But as former head of HR in Salesforce, you may know that we're building a brand new campus at the, uh, beside the Central Bank in Dublin. Um, a lot of organizations, including Salesforce, um, are very focused on diversity and inclusion, and it's a tagline, EDI, DNI, and i um, that organizations use. But while diversity gets a lot of coverage, particularly in companies, I think we're still lagging when it comes to inclusion. Therefore, when we were designing the new campus, the team in Dublin were determined to go beyond the standard accessibility requirements and use the principles of universal design to ensure that the campus is inclusive and accessible to all. I hope you all get an opportunity to come and visit the campus at some stage in the new year. Um, and that's my plug done, so um, I'm, I'm going to go on to today's speakers. Joining me on stage today, I have four speakers, and I'm delighted to welcome Claire Henderson, Katie Usher, Tony Murphy, Tony Murray rather, sorry Tony, and Selena Bonney. So Claire and Katie are co-presenting and have partnered on the India Buildings in Liverpool, which won the 2022 Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland Universal Design Award. The Institute said that the building provides environments that are based on need rather than status, allowing staff to work in a way that feels best for them, whether at a traditional desk, a quiet work area, or an enclosed private room, or open collaboration area. It cleverly solves the issue for neurodivergent people through the provision of natural lighting, restorative and neutral spaces for people to take time out from stressful or upsetting situations, and sensory muted spaces where visual and tactile distractions are minimized. So first up will be Claire, I think, yeah. Um, so Claire is the inclusive design lead uh, within service design and user experience at HMRC. That's Her Majesty's Revenue Commissioners, for those of you who don't know. And for those of you who haven't heard, she has a new prime minister. <laughs> um, she is currently working with the Government Hubs program alongside industry leading experts such as ACON and CIC to ensure that they are delivering uh, exclusive and welcoming workplaces for colleagues, while also ensuring our, the, diverse, the inclusive design principles remain alive and at the front and centre of the minds of all those involved in the program. When Claire uh, initially and I connected, she had told me that they were at one uh, inclusive environment project. They now have completed six, and I think that's an amazing testament to HMRC in the UK for the work they're doing there. Claire has a project and change management background, and pl prior to joining HMRC five years ago, she worked in the private sector, in the main financial services, so she's many years of navigating compliance and red tape, which has been invaluable for her current role. Outside work, she likes to keep busy, and each year, rather than set a new year resolution, she likes to stop something and try to learn a new skill. And this year's aim was to learn some Spanish. So have we have any Spanish speakers in the audience, we can test Claire later. <laughs> uh, she also likes to restore old furniture, so maybe Spanish furniture, um, and has a range of different items at her home. Partnering with her today is Katie, uh, an associate with Ward Robinson Design. And she's an enthusiastic, efficient, and organized designer. She has an excellent visualization skills and a photographer's eye for balancing detail and space, combining with a strong technological background and specialist multimedia skills. 
She's been with Ward Robinson for eight years and is involved in a wide range of projects and takes part in all aspects of Ward Robinson's design output, from inception through to design, construction, right through to the final photo shoot and publications. She's recently involved, as I said, with the winning India Buildings project with HMRC. I also welcome, welcome to welcome Selena, Selena Bonney. Selena is a South Dublin County Council's Disability Liaison Officer, Liaison Access and Equality Officer, sorry, Selena. Uh, she's an activist and academic in the International Disabled People's Movement for more than 25 years. She's Regional Ambassador for NUIG, that's Galway Centre for Disability Law and Policy in the Real Productive, Just, Real, Real Productive Justice Research Project. She has a master's degree in disability studies from the University of Leeds and a professional diploma in human rights and equality from the IPA and IHREC. Selena is a proud disabled mother uh, to a precious, precocious 14 year old, maybe precious and precocious, uh, and is a passionate home cook. Last on the stage today, we'll be speaking is Tony Murray. Tony is a lead IT architect working with the Central Bank of Ireland. As well as, well as leading a team of senior solution architects, taking the technical lead on large complex projects with the bank, which often involves sig significant external stakeholder management. He also represents the bank on a number of European expert um, and design working groups. Tony is a fully blind person and has always had a strong interest in areas of inclusive design, usability and accessibility. He was involved in the consultation regarding the inclusive design process, which was applied to the central bank's North Wall Key building uh, and the internal architecture there. He also supported on the National Disability Authority e-learning module, which you'll hear a bit more about later, which has been developed for professionals involved in the design and procurement of buildings, using the Central Bank as a case study. Outside of work, Tony is a hobbyist musician, playing guitar in two Dublin-based rock bands. He's also a huge fan of support, primarily GA and soccer. So at the end of the presentation, we will have some time for questions, providing we all stick to our time slots. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Claire and Katie to take us away. So, hi everybody. Um, as Terry says, I'm Claire Henderson. I'm the Inclusive Workspace Design Lead for HMRC, which is actually now His Majesty's oh. Revenue and Customs. <laughs> um, so, the equivalent of your um, UK or sorry, your Irish Tax Authority. So, your um, uh, the equivalent of that. So, um, I'm going to follow Terry's lead and describe myself for those that are visually impaired. So, I'm white, female, five foot five and three quarters. <laughs> um, I, today, I have a black shirt with some coloured spots on it and cream trousers. And standing with me is Katie, although she does stand about a foot taller than me. Um, and we didn't plan to coordinate our outfits, but we have managed to also be cream and black. So we're doing quite well with that as a starting point. Now, let me see if I can move this slide on. Maybe not. There we go. Um, so as Terry said, Katie um, is one of our designers from Ward Robinson. Um, we've worked with Ward Robinson and various other design partners since 2015 when we started our programme of redevelopment of our um, estate. So it's been a programme that's been ongoing for some quite some time. Um, so when we were pulling together this presentation, we were trying to think, what do we want to tell you about? What do we want to talk? What impression do we want to give of our programme? And we came up with this really snappy title, which you can't quite see on screen yet, but um, the title we headed was Creating a Design Culture at the Heart of HMRC's Relocation Programme. So short and snappy, really to the point. <laughs> Um, perhaps not, but it does give you a sense of the journey that we've been on. This isn't just one building, one project. This has been ongoing for quite some time and will continue to be so. Um, so it's been a rolling journey for us and a learning for certainly us as a government body. And I'm sure Katie will talk about how it's been a learning for them as our design support as well. So to give you a scale or sorry, a, an idea of the scale of our programme, to date we have delivered 13 government hubs and those range in size from supporting 1,500 people up to, um, I think at the moment our largest is around 4,000 people. Once our final building comes online, that will be for around about 10,000 members of staff in that one building, so a huge piece of work. In addition to that, we have some smaller specialist sites. So in total, we're talking about an estate, roughly um, 18 buildings and around about 60,000 employees that, that we're looking after. So quite a big piece of work. 
Um, one other thing I should say, and apologies, I'm so in the habit of talking about inclusive design that I probably will say that all the way through, um, but that is the equivalent of, of what you would call universal design. It's just different terminology we use in the UK. Oh, it does move. So we were really chuffed to be um, asked by NDA to come along and talk today following um, the award for Liverpool's India building. So to be recognised by the Royal Institute of Architects Ireland was amazing. Um, we are really committed to trying to get our ambition, our inclusive ethos out there, not just to government bodies, but actually to the wider construction industry, because for us, those are the people that we need to influence. Those are the people that ultimately at the end of the day we rely on to create the buildings and to create the facilities for our people. So it's really great to have this opportunity to speak to everybody here today. So thank you for that. Um, so I've given you some insight about our programme. Katie will talk to you specifically about the design process for the project at India Buildings, which um, one of our most successful projects, but also probably I'm sure you'll agree, Katie, probably one of the most difficult because it's a grade two listed heritage building. So a lot of our estate was uh, built from the foundations upwards and effectively we could do what we wanted within realms. Um, India buildings were slightly different in that we had to preserve that heritage nature and preserve the history of the building um, for Liverpool City as well. So um, on screen just now, you can see um, a, a very basic cartoon example of the journey that we took in terms of getting our heads around what do we actually mean about inclusive design. So this was really our starting point. Um, it shows you the stages of, of progressing from poor design, which doesn't work for anybody, through to accessible design, which, yes, it works for everybody, but is that the right thing, um, to the end image, which in our mind is a much more inclusive one solution suits all of our building users. So, um, it really highlights for me the fact that inclusivity embraces accessibility as a preset, but actually you can't have um, inclusive design without accessibility. And that really inclusive design goes much further than just accessibility. So quite a bold statement to make um, and one that we do make quite regularly. So I'm not going to um, apologise for it, but I hope to be able to show that uh, that really is at the heart and the culture of what HMRC do. So prior to our programme starting, um, we did have experience of running a state. Obviously, we had 60,000 people in buildings throughout the United Kingdom. Um, to give you a bit of a taste of that, it was something like 130 buildings that we had previously. We've now consolidated down into um, this round about 18. So we had 60,000 uh, employees. We knew we had accessibility uh, requirements that we needed to make. Um, but we also knew how design teams in the UK tended to deal with these. And um, for those of you that aren't aware, um, accessibility in the UK is very much driven by a set of standards. Uh, so that's known as BS 83000. Um, it's accessible as opposed to inclusive. So you'll tend to find in the UK that design teams very much stick to that. It says this in the, in the guidebook and whilst there's open to interpretation in some ways, very much try to just tick that box of compliance rather than going that step further and really thinking about what does this mean for the people in the building. So um, around about 25 years ago, uh, HMRC tried to start thinking about the estate and what we needed to do with our estate in the future. And at that point, um, we were down to uh, PFI, so that's private finance initiatives for those that maybe don't know. So those have about a 25 year lifespan. So we had 10 years to go. What do we do? How do we get to the point of having a building that works for us in the future? So it's a fundamental review. Um, it wasn't just about the buildings. It was about how do we work in those buildings? What do we do? How do our people need to access the right spaces for the work that they're involved in? And obviously in the background, there was um, a lot of digitization of processes and how our customers interact with us. I'm getting told I've got a minute left, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, so we decided we needed a little bit more agility. So we started creating spaces, as, as Terry mentioned earlier, that were not just your standard working desk um, with screens, computers. There were spaces for you to go away and think about um, your collaboration with your colleagues, having quiet spaces. We had some people that were starting to work more from home as well as in the office. And obviously that was in 2015. So before we even thought about COVID and working from home and the like, so um, the agility was there at the outset. Thank you. Next. 
sorry, I've skipped my page. Um, so I mentioned earlier about flexibility. So in the UK, PAS 3000 is a, a way of working guide. And effectively, it's about smarter working. It's about agile working, using different spaces for different things, thinking about how you interact with your team. So that was fine and well, and you can see from the images on screen that we've got lots of different workspaces, but we also needed to think about how we deliver these spaces in a fair way that works for everybody that needs to use them. So we wanted to create spaces where everyone would feel equally valued, much more importantly, equally respected in the workplace. So I'm going to show you um, an example of one of the things we started as our starting point for, for looking at our buildings. I think Jer mentioned earlier about um, revolving doors. So. It's quite a simple example. How do you get into a building? So your first point is always the door to the building. That's your first impression of a building. So you can see in this image here, we have um, the traditional round doors, revolving doors that are um, a great way to get people into building and a great way to cut down on draft, etc. coming in. So it tends to be a designer or an architect's go-to. But actually, at the outset of your entry to the building, we're already dividing you into different groups. Those who can use a pass door, or those who have to use a pass door and those who can use a revolving door. So none of our buildings have revolving doors. They all have what we call clamshell doors so that effectively everybody can get through the same point of entry to the building and that culture of inclusivity is there from the outset. So physical and mental abilities and constraints, religion, gender, ethnicity, things that we've all spoken about this morning and they're all things that can potentially impact on how an individual feels in a building, whether they're comfortable or uncomfortable, and in fact, in any given situation. So we wanted to create spaces that everyone feels comfortable, everyone's equally valued and respected. And accessibility is a great starting point, but it is just the starting point. Um, when we started our programme in 2015, we realised that there was no definitive guidance for inclusive design, so we developed our own. Um, it was very clear very quickly that the approach to inclusive design should not start and end with a tick box of requirements. So we progressively developed our inclusive design guide, which you can see here. Um, we were lucky because we had a rolling programme of buildings. So um, was our first building perfect? Absolutely not. But it gave us the opportunity to start thinking about what do we need? What do our people use um, in the building? And how do they interact with the different spaces? And, HMRC is very lucky to have a wide network of um, disability groups that cover uh, everything from uh, visual impairments, uh, neurodiversity, etc., on and on. And they are actually very vocal, so we're fortunate in the fact that they're willing to speak up and talk to us and absolutely were key in helping us develop this guide. So personally, I think we've responded really well to our, our key values um, of inclusivity. We've captured that in our design guide. Um, but that is just a guide. You still have to have that culture behind the project and all of those involved. And the key to genuinely implementing inclusive design really comes with um, two factors for us, although it does show three pictures on this slide. Um, firstly, and a lot of people have mentioned this this morning, inclusive design has got to come from the top of the organisation. It has to come from the start of the design and the development process. Otherwise, it's too easy to say, oh, well, that's much too difficult for us to deliver now. We'll not bother. Um, secondly, to achieve inclusive design, the client, so in this instance, that was us and the design team, so Katie's guys, um, really have to buy in and it has to be a joint exercise. You really both have to really take the true concept of inclusivity and that's what you need to go with. Without that mindset, um, you're back to that tick box of accessibility as opposed to inclusivity. So uh, very quickly, one last slide from me before I hand you to Katie. So this is a, a quote from our guide, which I'm going to read rather than get it wrong. So HMRC aims to deliver great workplaces for everyone. So this means allowing people to access and work in our buildings confidently, independently, with dignity, regardless of their age, disability, race, religion, gender or sexual orientation. Quite a powerful statement. Um, so that is enough for me in terms of theory, and apologies, I'm probably way over time. Um, Katie, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Claire. And then, hello, everyone. In the short amount of time I have with you today, I would like to try and show you how I implemented the Inclusive Design and in Indie Buildings project. The scheme was not without its challenges, 
both design and in practice. This is a Grade 2 star, nine-storey listed building in the heart of Liverpool City Centre's historic central. Start building start in 1926, the original magnificence and grandeur had faded in recent decades and the best description that could be applied to the building at the start of the project was dilapidated. The original intent for our project was there would be two discrete phases of contracts. The first was to refurbish the envelope of the landlord and the landlord's areas of the buildings. And the second would be to refurbish the fit out of the tenant areas. Our good friends and architects, Fountain Chester Hall, led the design of the landlord works and we at Ward Robinson led the design for HMRC areas and the ten as the tenants of the building. Some facts and figures to give you some context. The refurbishment building provides 4,000 HMRC staff in a total of 28,000 metres squared of office floor area. Original features of particular note are the Holtz Arcade and the Regency Suite. With the constraints of inherit of all in heritage projects, bringing a building to the modern day standards was always going to be a challenge. To add some spice to that, the original phase one contractor went bust halfway through these works. With the time pressures and the need to have the overall refurbishment complete to tie in with the expiry of HMRC's existing lease arrangements, it was decided to run both landlords and tenants works simultaneously, and all of this during COVID lockdowns one, two and three. Not an ideal situation, but this is testament to the spirit and collaboration in which the whole project was undertaken, that the teams came together and the project was completed on time and in budget. Okay, that's the context. Let's look at some of the inclusive design features. I'll use the toilets as a very good demonstrable start point. HMRC's design brief is to provide good quality finishes and fittings throughout. Clearly that applies to the WCs, but also must apply to accessible WCs. Why wouldn't it? Led by the inclusive design guide, the accessible WCs had to be good accessible WCs, not just simply tick spot compliant WCs. Inclusive design is about providing the same quality for everyone. Therefore, the accessible WCs that were designed to the same quality as other WCs, yes, they have the necessarily, necessarily functional features of the accessible WCs. But if we are using stainless steel fittings in one set of WCs, then that is exactly the quality we should aim to be using in all WCs, including the accessible ones. Not skipping on. Well, there we go. In a slightly wider context, HMRC's approach to inclusivity is to also provide a proportion of super loos. Individual loos with pan, basin, vanity unit, and so forth. By their very nature, these are gender neutral. As you can imagine, notwithstanding the heritage constraints, the cause of the century old building did not lend themselves to the material alterations to suit HMRC's design standards. So to provide the super loos and a good accessible loos, HMRC committed was to give up the office floor space to ensure that we could have the numbers, size and variety of the facilities equally to serve the whole workforce. As you can see on this layout, not only do the provision of super loos, but we also have a voodoo room together with a reflection room. Hopefully you can now see we're starting to pick up the features to allow who may not be the major majority feel equal, respected and comfortable in the workplace. If I change tack a little now, within HMRC, there is a wonderful and diverse range of people, as there is in most workforces. Physical abilities and constraints tend to be more visible, mental abilities and constraints less so. To strive for inclusive workplace, neurodiversity has to be front and centre to all considerations. I confess that when we started our journey working with HMRC, we did not have a clear understanding of neurodiversity as a term, and we thank HMRC for educating us in this area. Our simple reference point for neurodiversity is, it describes the idea that people experience and interact with the world around us, them in many ways. There is no right way of thinking, learning and behaving, and differences are not viewed as a disadvantage. If we go back to Claire's description, 
of the change of the working practice HMRC, the shift to agile working and the workplace to provide work settings appropriate to each other's individuals or team's tasks at hand, this leads to provision of rich varied workplace. This ties perfectly in with the design which acknowledges, addresses and includes of neurodiversity. We may, what may be a piece of sleek, modern, efficient design for one person may be a stark, bare and lonely scene for another person. Bold colours and striking contrasts can provide wonderful interest for one person, but overpowering and worrying for another. None of the people involved are right or wrong, and none of the pieces of design are right or wrong. Within neurodiversity, we found that the key designs were produced a range of settings from a calm, muted and gentle to the varied bold and the richness of textures and so forth. Our job was to attempt to provide something for everyone. Aside from the designer's point of view, you can imagine how fantastic it is to be asked to design with this brief. Truly wonderful. I really hope that this couple of examples start to give you the insight of the totally inclusivity design. When we started two ways about it, we freely transport access, accessibility and inclusivity with the help of the guidance of HMRC, our understanding group. Accessibility is a critical foundation of a good design, but inclusive design goes much further. For accessibility, we designed to make spaces compliant. For inclusivity, we designed to make the space where everyone could be comfortable and at ease. We found that we needed the mindset and the culture and the approach that requires us to challenge every piece of design we generated, every piece of furniture we specified and every colour palette proposed. Is it inclusive? Are we excluding anyone? Are we providing choice? From our team's point of view, we have that as a consequence of immersing ourselves in a culture of inclusive design, it is almost impossible to look at design based on mere accessibility compliance. I'll give you two tiny examples of indie buildings. The various key points in the building, around the building, we have fully accessible compliant designs. As much case, all the boxes are ticked. But we also have fridges that are on slight plinths so that people in wheelchairs have the same ability as others to reach the bottom shelves. HMRC have staff with visual impaired who have guide dogs. India Building is in the heart of Liverpool city centre. Where can these guide dogs go to relieve themselves? We have washable and ventilated dog spend areas in the basement. This is just two very modest and very different examples of getting into the mindset and the culture of inclusive design of trying to think of all elements of the design through an inclusivity at heart of the process. Is it inclusive? Are we excluding anyone? Are we providing choice? With HMRC, what we have designed is not perfect. I don't think it ever can be. What it is is a result of a client who embraced inclusive design, who committed to it at the start of the design and development process, who brought and projected their culture of equal value and equal respect to their design team. Fly back to you. Thank you. So, um, I was just going to finish by saying a few more lines, but we've already had our time up signed, so I'm just going to say thank you very much for listening to us. And if you do have any questions that we don't get time to answer today, um, or as part of this panel, then feel free to stop Katie and I as you see us wandering around, um, and we'll happily chat for much more. <laughs> so, thank you very much. So next up, we have Selena, who's going to present from her chair there uh, at the other side of the stage. Let's see if this clicker is turned on. Did it work? No. Yeah? Ah, great. Okay. Thanks. Great. Um, right, well, thank you to the NDA, I'm say, today to, for the opportunity to share my experiences and observations regarding the importance of taking a universal design approach to the design and delivery of public services, and in particular to share South Dublin County Council's experience of providing accessibility. My observations are based on my experience as a disabled person, a public servant, a mother, an academic, and an activist. And I've worked for South Dublin County Council since 2002, and been in the role of Access and Equality Officer since 2006, although every few years it seems to get a longer and longer title. 
um, I have a deep understanding of how essential it is to approach equality in human rights and indeed accessibility or universal design in an intersectional way. Accessibility to the built environment significantly impacts on a person's everyday life. Good access or design empowers, enables and facilitates dignity. Poor design or non-existent access disables, disempowers, isolates and restricts. Inaccessible environments create disabling barriers which have a significant impact on the lives and choices of disabled persons, people with mobility impairments and indeed our wider networks of family and friends. A council's core function is to provide essential services and infrastructure to the diverse communities that we serve and to support and build sustainable communities where all the people of, in my case, the county, feel valued, welcomed and included. In order to fulfil this function, we must take universal design, diversity, intergenerational families and intersectionality into account. In recent decades, largely influenced by economic considerations, families have returned to intergenerational living as adult children remain in the family home and working parents rely on older family members and for childminding and other caring duties. Intersectionality is a framework for understanding how social identities such as gender, race, ethnicity, social class, religion, sexual orientation, ability and gender identity overlap, overlap with one another. Understanding intersectionality with regard to disability is essential for the design and delivery of accessible, inclusive facilities and services because what makes disability unique is that anyone, regardless of their social identity, can become a disabled person at any stage in their life. Local authorities are required to comply with a variety of laws and regulations connected with the varied core services that we deliver. In addition to those specifically focused on our hard services, which are uh, planning, waste management and provision of accommodation, there are also international and national accessibility, equality and human rights responsibilities, which have particular significance for the work of a council. For example, the UNCRPD, there's particularly four articles that would that have quite impact on our work, and that would be nine, which is accessibility, 19, living independently and being included in the community, Article 21, freedom of expression and opinion and access to information, and Article 30, participation in cultural life, recreation, leisure and sport. Other legislation, of course, would be the Disability Act 2005, particularly as part three and five. The IREC, uh, the Human Rights and Equality Act, particularly public sector duty, section 42. And I would also, I think it's important to acknowledge the Irish Sign Language Act of 2017. And I think that's something that local authorities in particular and uh, other agencies are grappling with a bit because, you know, we have to remember there's more to accessibility and universal access than just kind of ramps and, and what have you. We apply these laws and regulations at local level through county development plans, local area plans, housing strategies, social inclusion and age-friendly strategies, public sector equality and, and human rights duty frameworks and so on. It's quite an extensive non, you know, list. Section, well, one I would think I would like to highlight is section 4.5 of the European Standard on Accessibility and Usability of the Built Environment states that accessibility should be integrated at all stages of procurement, design, construction and conformity assessment. This way of working is not, was not a new concept in South Dublin County Council. A core value of our corporate plan is inclusiveness, equality and accessibility and an overarching consideration within our county development plan includes reference to creating socially and physically inclusive neighbourhoods. South Dublin County Council provides and funds a broad range of services, including housing, roads and public lighting, walking and cycling routes, parks and playgrounds, libraries, sports facilities, litter control, and so on. By focusing on universal design principles, 
we can move away from the often held presumptions that access only benefits disabled people and that access is mainly focused on provision of toilets, ramps and parking. By focusing on universal design, the access needs of deaf or blind people, children, older people and those with learning or literacy difficulties are also acknowledged. I'm delighted to have the opportunity today to share a selection of examples of how we've applied universal design principles across South Dublin County Council's facilities and services. I'm going to show you a few slides that do have images and I will give brief descriptions of each image but if anybody would like me to go into more detail after the panel just come over and, and, and we can have a chat. That's not, I'm quite happy to do so. Oh, the anticipation of waiting for it to respond. <laughs> the temptation to keep pressing. Great. Okay, well, the first slide has two images on it. Um, the top image is from Tallis Stadium, um, so a facility in South Dublin we're quite proud of, I can tell you. And this is of the area in one of the stands that's designated for wheelchair users to view the, the pitch from. We're currently in the process of building the fourth stand and we've taken on board access um, feedback over the last couple of years um, that we will now address with the fourth stand because of course through actually using the facilities and getting user feedback we've realised there are a few issues we need to resolve and of course the final stand is the time to do it. So, um, the, and in the bottom facility is of the Valhalla housing um, complex in Clondalkin and, and this uh, was built using sustainable principles and environmental principles as well as universal design and it was in partnership with um, one of the housing agencies, the housing bodies and the council and it was Cheshire, I hope, I hope I'm correct on that now but and um, so there's like individuals, they one, one bedroom apartments that are all universally designed so it would be quite a mixed grouping of people living in it, not just for disabled persons. And the, oh gosh, okay, let's see. Oh, no. Okay, um, this slide also has two images on it. The top image is of one of our mobile library vehicles. And it's showing this, with this one, there are two entrances. One has the, the platform lift for wheelchair users to use to enter and then the second entrance would be the stepped lift. But inside these mobile libraries, of course, we, we have looked at providing a range of books that would be of interest, whether it's by disabled authors or different relevant themes. Uh, my goodness, five minutes already. <laughs> um, and then the second image is of our frame football pitch. So it's of three young frame footballers. A frame football is when it's kind of like a rollator, but rather than pushing it, you pull. And these young sports people use it in order to engage in football. And we built um, a special pitch that enables the, the frames to move freely and safely on it. Um, I'll fly past that just County Hall and for two images again, one's at the entrance to County Hall, which is going to change because we're redeveloping at the moment and it's going to be a, a wonderful multifunction, universally designed public space when we're finished. So, and then the second image is just an example of, of the Braille and tactile wayfinding signage because one thing is with a local authority, we're also got to consider the Official Languages Act. So our Braille and tactile signage also has to be in Irish and English and the Irish has to be above the English. So we had to take that into account as well. Braille and tactile wayfinding signage has been installed across the county um, in all our public facilities, including our libraries and community centres and the stadium and, and as well. And we've also put audio frequency induction loops in across our facilities. And one thing we soon we made with that was, for example, if you come to a customer care area and there is four what's the word, it's not kiosk, but desks for individual service points. Rather, so in some places you'll find where, say, desk A has the loop and you have to queue and wait for desk A. What we did was we put a loop into all of them so that it's 
one, you don't have to spend extra time just because you need this access support, and two, it's more discreet for people. They don't have to kind of go, hey, I need the loop system. Um, they can just get about their business. We build playgrounds and play spaces with the assumption that there are places for everyone to play together. We see inclusiveness as centrally important to all of our play spaces to aim, and aim to create places that meet the diverse needs of children and their parents or grandparents or caregivers. A universal design criteria was included in the tender documents during the procurement process for, the, for our play spaces across the county. This slide I have up now has three images, examples of our play spaces across the county. So the top left is like, includes a sand play area where children can play together. The top right is more wheelchair accessible, again, sand play area. And then the bottom image is of what's called a basket swing. So children, regardless of their physical access needs, can all play together and swing together on, on this. And if hopefully this, sorry, did I press it hard enough? I'm afraid to press it again. Yeah, here we go. And just very quickly, these wooden pigs in mud um, is a sensory play facility, uh, facility in Timon Park. And it was actually designed with the students and teachers in a school for children with um, sensory needs. So they worked with our staff to design this sensory play area together. So I, I think it was really, really, we love to highlight this particular fun facility. Um, there are many elements that require consideration with regard to creating and maintaining sustainable, vibrant communities. And a core issue that I believe is essential to highlight today is the importance of access to appropriate sanitary facilities. And as a, as a disabled person and an access officer, I spent so much of my life discussing toilets, looking at toilets, looking at plans of toilets, so much so that I've even been gifted by a family member of a small mini toilet pencil holder for my desk. <laughs> you know, something that delights my daughter, I must say. Um, so what I would like to do, I won't go into detail, and I'm happy to make my my script accessible to anybody who would like it, because I'm conscious I don't take them too much time. But I would like, I'm quite proud of our changing place facilities. We have two, one in County Hall and one in our new North Kondokan Library and we're building two more. One will be in Tallis Stadium, and the fourth will be in the new Lucan Swimming Pool. So we're really, really proud of these facilities. And actually, thinking in what you were mentioning about the design, this was something we were very conscious of. So on this image, is, this is from our County Hall um, Changing Places facility. Um, our the architect was so careful about choosing beautiful tiles for the walls and making it an, an, an like a welcoming facility to use. And just the other thing to mention, because to remember if you are putting it in a changing place facility is there are two different bars for hoists. And uh, one is more, more widely used, but there is a second type. So what we did is we bought both because we felt why spend the money on putting in a changing place facility that only some people can use. So that was a very conscious decision that, we, that we've made with both, and we'll make it with the next two as well. So just to be aware of, of that. As a mother, I also find changing place facilities wonderful because when my daughter was little, trying to find somewhere where I could actually go in my wheelchair with my assistant and my baby in a pram, we were very, very limited. Um, and the other thing is quite often the baby changing bench is in the accessible toilet but it's not accessible. Um, so when I'm advising, working with our, our architects, I always specify what height the bench must go in at so that disabled caregivers can look after children as, as well. Sorry, I know I'm taking too much time. Um, just very briefly uh, in relation to my role. Um, I, as I said, I've got a very long title, it's Disability Aids and Access and Equality Officer. But what my job, and I am a standalone, I'm, it's not an add-on to a pre-existing. Um, in South Dublin, they decided to create this standalone position. So this is my focus, equality and accessibility is my pure focus. 
So to break down my job very quickly, I do cover the three functions in accordance with the Disability Act. So that's access officer, inquiry officer, and the HR function, liaison officer. I also implement our plain English guidelines. So I would do a lot of plain English proofing of our documents. And I also do the traditional access officer role. So I do go out with access nagging. I do review plans and work with our architects and planners in, in that regard. And then I also then uh, are, is, I'm the equality officer. So I would have a wider kind of diversity and equality remit as well. No, just to finish up, I think that's about it really, I'll skip through everything else. But I would just like to highlight, in relation to accessibility, um, we also have to acknowledge challenges. And there's three challenges that I think it's worth kind of put, putting out there. One is maintaining accessibility, maintaining universal design. So it's not just about putting it in. We've got to make sure that we build in actions, whether it's budgets, cleaning and repair schedules, or staff training to make sure that this continues. And secondly, when it comes to a local authority, we have to manage public expectations because not everything is in the gift of the local authority. An example of that being during the recent pandemic, when there was a lot of accessible parking blocked by outdoor dining, and the well, council needs to do something about this. But the problem is we can't go into a private car park like a shopping center. So I was trying to explain to the public, we'd love to do something about it, but unfortunately we can't. There's, there are limitations. And then just balancing safety with accessibility. And it's a constant conundrum for us, whether it's if you put in a hand sanitizer at a low height for wheelchair users, is that making it accessible to children and putting them in danger, or whether it's putting in a bench and have it being a focal point for antisocial behaviour. So there's those considerations. And that's it really, just to finish today. Every individual has the power to affect change and be a champion for universal accessibility, regardless of your profession or location. Universal design truly is the foundation of sustainable, vibrant communities. And I believe that moving on from accessibility to a universal design approach makes a significant positive contribution to the equality of life of all members of the community. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to ask someone to run my slides for me. So if we can throw up the introduction slide first, that'd be really helpful. You're good to go, Tony. Thanks, Terry. So uh, my name is Tony Murray. Um, this, this is one of the least interesting slides. Uh, that was an introduction to myself. So um, I've been working um, in the central bank for seven years, um, working in IT, the industry for the past 21 years. Um, you know, I've got a, uh, I also I also work as a director in the National Council of the Blind of Ireland. I've been doing that for the past five or six years. So my work is kind of uh, primarily involved with uh, technology, but on the side, I'm very interested in the whole area of um, access to employment, access to education, inclusive universal design. Like like Claire, I'm going to use the, the, the wrong terminology. So um, for, forgive me if you will. So um, I'm going to have a quick chat with you today uh, about kind of um, my, my kind of take on the world of navigating as a blind person, the Central Bank of Ireland building, uh, etc. So if we can get the next slide, please. Show me the overview. Yeah. Thank you. So as I said, I'm going to talk to you briefly about navigating as a blind person to kind of set the context for what I'm going to be going on about later on. I want to go to talk to the Central Bank of Ireland. The kind of barriers that I, that I face and that most blind people can face in terms of navigation. Um, I'm going to talk to you then about the Central Bank building, which is kind of the, the, the meat and potatoes of my uh, presentation. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the kind of user engagement element of it, which I was uh, delighted to be a part of um, back when the design of the Central Bank building was being uh, drawn up. Um, it's, it's kind of a little bit humbling to be here today because I know I'm amongst uh, a lot of professionals who are, who are in, the, in the area of universal design, etc. And it's, it's a real honour to, to share a stage here with uh, my colleagues. 
and it's a real it's a real pleasure to be to have been asked by the NDA to come along here and talk today. So uh, I'm, I'm really, really delighted to be here. So if we can get the next slide, please. So, thanks Terry. So, <clears throat> navigating as a blind person. Now, first thing to say is everybody's experience of this is different. Every blind person, every visually impaired person's um, experience of navigating is different. People use different cues, people use different techniques, etc. So, personally, um, I use a white cane. Um, I've got pretty good spatial awareness. I've got a pretty good sense of direction. Um, in my, in my physical uh, environment, in terms of my, my, my mental capacity, my sense of direction is possibly not so. I, I, my mind tends to wander and I tend to, to lose track. As we say in, in, a, in my family at home, I, I branch a lot when I'm telling stories, so <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> so, um, but usually, you know, it's, it's, um, I think, I think um, it's, it's down to um, processing a series of inputs in terms of where you are. Um, what what what's out there to, to facilitate in terms of your orientation, etc. So, and I, I guess I guess everybody does this regardless of your ability or disability. But um, from my perspective, I rely on things like straight lines, um, right angles. I don't do kind of open spaces particularly well. I tend to get a little bit lost if, if I've nothing to kind of orientate myself against. I utilize this uh, this whole concept of echolocation, which I'm not going to go into too much. But if you want, to, if you're interested in it, it's it's, it's worth a Google. Um, it's 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 sort of like sonar, so you can kind of use acoustics bouncing off hard surfaces to kind of navigate and orientate orientate yourself within a, within an environment. So, really, the way. The way I get about the place is, as I said, process series of inputs, audio inputs, kind of use my echolocation to kind of figure out there could be a wall coming up within a meter or two ahead of you, and you know, you know when to turn and, and when to do kind of, and, and then, uh, you know, processing things like how, how, my, how my stick is moving along the, the, the ground and what kind of, you know, you know am, I, am I hitting curbs, what's the, what's the texture of the surface I'm walking on. Uh, Etc. So it's it's as I said, it's a range of inputs. I think I think the inputs I probably uh, use are probably different to the series of inputs that uh, someone with uh, with sight probably uses, but it, it, it's all for the same all for the same end of, of of kind of navigating navigating your environment. In terms of barriers to, to navigating, loud noises and, and, and noisy atmospheres kind of tends to, to to kind of get in my way around navigating because it, it, it kind of compromises my my, my echolocation. My my sonar goes goes into haywire when I when I uh, when it's in a, in a loud environment. Um, if things aren't different, if there's no contrast, and you can kind of probably imagine where I'm going with this based on the previous presentations. If things aren't in contrast, I can kind of sometimes maybe lose my way, not know how far I am from something because there's no there's no telltale sign signs between myself and my destination that I can use as a landmark or something like that. Um, so and barriers can be thrown up. You could have the most universally designed, perfect environment um, to be operating in, but but humans can often inadvertently throw barriers by kind of you know dropping a dropping a suitcase or something in your way, or 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 or, or, or standing in your way, or, or something like that. So this it's not it's not a perfect science either in terms of not, um, uh, reducing the barriers associated with uh, with the navigation. But that's life, and we we just get on with it, don't we? So if I can get my next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Central Bank uh, of Ireland building. So as I said, I started working in the, in the Central Bank uh, in 2015. Uh, at that stage, we were based in Dame Street in the old Central Bank building, which most people will probably know and remember. Um, I think it's a donut shop now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so at the time when I started, I, I was, uh, you know, I was, I was really delighted to be, to be working in that area. Um, I, was, I wasn't used to working in a, in a, in a building which was designed with a, a, a usability, accessibility in mind. Um, I'd worked, as I said, for, for a number of years, I think 14 odd years, 15 odd years in, in, in an industry in that place, bouncing around different buildings and different IT uh, companies and, you know, different, even different countries at times where there was challenges all the time, you know, I was facing barriers, you know, and I was, I was, I was overcoming them because I had to. Um, and to be honest with you, I never really thought about it too much because it was just how it was, you know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't used to, 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 to engaging or, or, or interacting with uh, kind of fully accessible or, or fully usable environments. So it was just kind of, it was probably subconsciously just a little bit stressful to be dealing with it, but I just, you know, I was, I was, I was out there doing my job and doing my work and interacting with people. So I just, uh, I had to get on with it. But, I was asked at the time to, to kind of engage with a user group to look at the design of the Central Bank of Building, uh, Central Bank of Ireland, uh, North Wall Key building. 
we also call it NWQ uh, in our place. So, um, again, I suffered with a little bit of imposter syndrome. I didn't really know what I was meant to be doing. I kind of understood, uh, you know, um, user-centered design from the perspective of software and development and, and, and architecture and design, which is the kind of area I come from. But um, I wasn't really, I wasn't really clear on, on what I was, what the ask was, which I think was was beneficial in, in terms of the the, the, the use case uh, for me. So I was I was pr pretty much a, a clueless user coming in to talk about what I what I kind of thought was needed from the building, which is great. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, at the end of the slide. But when I actually managed to to, to get to the central bank uh, building, um, it involved so many kind of pardon the pun, eye-opening experiences for me, whereby there was universal uh, design built in, which meant that my experience of, of traveling and moving through the building became so seamless that it only, it only began to occur to me once I moved there how many challenges I faced on a daily basis in my previous life uh, in, in these kind of non-accessible buildings. Um, and, <laughs> As a kind of an upshot from that, I kind of do a little bit kind of resent having to go into buildings that aren't particularly well designed these days, and I never did do that before. So elements of the Central Bank of Ireland building, the NWQ building, which I'm talking about, um, there's things like contrasting colours, there's things like contrasting, contrasting textures. Now, you'll, you'll have heard many people today talking about these, these contrasts. Obviously, I don't... Um, Avail of the contrast in colours, but I, I understand that it's 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 uh, you know do doors kind of pop uh, uh, out of the environment in terms of the the, the uh, you know the, the the overall kind of walls and 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 uh, areas within the building. Um, an interesting one for me, in which I use every day when I'm in the building, is the is the varying contrasts underfoot. So. The building has all these kind of beautiful tiled areas for you know breakout areas. Um, then there's kind of like there's there's a, a lot of open spaces. And I just I said at the start I don't do particularly well in open spaces, but in the central bank of building, open, uh, central bank of own building, open spaces to me are no problem at all because I've got guides on the floor which let me navigate around seamlessly around these kind of um, breakout spaces. Because if I just stick to the smooth part on the floor, I know I'm good. Down beside alongside each uh, area where the desks are. There's a little strip along the side of the floor, which is kind of wooden, and then the rest of the floor is, is, is carpet, open area. I put the tip of my stick on the smooth bit, and I just walk along as easily as it is for anyone else in the building to walk along. I get a great sense of satisfaction from doing that. I still do have worked in the building for five years now, notwithstanding the little break we had there for the pandemic and all that jazz. But um, another thing as well about the building I find really useful is, you know, all of the doors open inwards, you know, all of the tea stations, coffee stations, I'm a huge fan of coffee stations, are all in the same area on every floor. Um, it's uniformity, it's easy to find. Um, only Tuesday I was, in, I was in the building and I, 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 have to, I have to fly to Frankfurt in November for a, for a conference in the ECB. And I had to meet one of the guys at the travel desk and he said to me, um, you know, you need to come and you need to come get your, your, your flights and hotels booked. And I said, yeah, okay. And he said, can you meet me at the at the coffee station on two? And I was like, yeah, no problem. Picked up my laptop and went down to bed, no problem at all. I know exactly where I'm going. I know exactly where the stairs are. Whereas in a previous life, in a previous, in an older building, if someone had said to me, can you meet me at such and such a place on floor, such and such, I'd be kind of go, well, would, would you mind just coming to my desk? Because I'm not really sure where that is, you know? So it's it's the, the, the ease of, of, of navigating the building is, is a real significant thing for me. Um, I think on, on that um, vein as well, what, what I really enjoy, and I had a chat with Terry about this last night at dinner, it's, 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 the, it's the fact that people interact with these elements that are implemented to facilitate accessibility in buildings uh, who are maybe fully sighted or have not, haven't got a disability, and they don't even realise they're utilising and enjoying the aspects of universal design that I, I use as well to, to, facilitate, to aid me in my, in my navigation of the building. So there's things like, you know, um, being in a nice kind of environment within the in the library area in the building, which is in the next slide, um, you know, utilizing kind of the, the fact that everything's in a uniform place, so everyone knows where the the, the, the card swipes are into rooms, into various doorways. Everyone knows how the meeting rooms are set up. Everyone knows that, you know, the large meeting rooms are on the west side near the, the north end of every floor in the building. You know, it's these kind of these kind of things that they they, they don't even realise that this, these are u universal designs, kind of accessibility, usability, and aspects of the of the of the environment that they're using that I rely on every day, and it's good to know that they're relying on them too. It's it's a it's a great equaliser, you know. So it's um it's a nice way to be. So 
Terry, I might ask you to move on to the next couple of slides, and I'm going to I'm going to actually ask Terry to come and describe some of these images because we have a I have a, a perfunctory enough label on each of the images to facilitate their kind of understanding. But it might be better to get Terry's kind of uh, take on these. Well, your labels are very good, Tony. Um, so the three pictures on the screen now. They're the top left picture when I'm looking at it. Top. Yeah, top left, um, is of the reception area. And although it's kind of hard to see, the desk is at different levels. Um, so for different people, uh, either different heights or in wheelchairs, or um, they can actually approach the desk at the right level for them. Uh, the second picture at the bottom then is of a meeting space, um, like a library meeting space, um, which is has different floor textures. So you'll see, uh, for those of you who can't see it, it's darker has a carpet and then the, the white is tiled so that if you're moving across the space you can feel the difference in the texture um, and there is there are seating arrangements as well there. Uh, the final picture then is Tony at the lift. So you're looking good there Tony. Um, <laughs> so these are smart lifts and these are programmable so when Tony patches his badge on the lift um, it recognizes him and it knows where to take him. Um, so instead of having to figure out floors and so on um, so the smart lift works uh, to the individual user needs. On to the next slide. Uh, we can see here as well three more pictures. Um, at the top left, uh, we have a breakout space. Again, different uh, floor textures, but also different seating areas. So different types of furniture uh, for different people, and a lot of space for wheelchair users um, and so on. And the second picture then is of the staff restaurant. Again, different floor textures, but also different heights, um, but actually fairly consistent height, low level height uh, for the serving areas so that people can access that. And the final picture then is actually the atrium stairs, which is a little bit dizzy looking at it if you're looking at it because actually it's looking down um, into the stairwell. But I, what I notice certainly is the consistency um, of the floors, sort of it, it, off the store well, um, and then sort of the, the fact that it brings everything together. So it's an easy route uh, for somebody to follow. Right. Thank you, Terry. We're nearly out of time as well. <laughs> yeah, so just to, just to, to tie it all together, so it's kind of, um, it, I think, I hope that gives you a sense of, of what, I've, what I was talking about in terms of the, the, the uniformity and, and, as Terry said, the kind of the way in which everything is tied together and it's easy to kind of figure out where you are and how you're navigating. And, you know, as, as, as a blind person, it kind of, as I said at the very start, I do tend to, to, to utilise kind of straight lines and right angles. In the central bank of building, a central, central bank of Ireland building still gives me kind of a real sense of kind of a, a bit, a bit of a kick out of being able to kind of make kind of a U-shaped navigation around a, a breakout area without kind of walking into anybody or something like that. You know, so it's uh, it's, a, it's it's a nice way to be. So we'll get the next slide, please. I'll be brief on this one. So I mentioned at the start, um, I was talking about the kind of user engagement elements that went into this building. I know that's a, that's a tenant of of a universal design. So it was really it was really good to be involved. And to have my kind of my own individual needs assessed, heard, and implemented. My other colleagues that were involved in the user group assessed and 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 um, and have their their needs uh, in, you know implemented as part of the design. You know, so it was really fulfilling, and I think it's it makes it, it makes a great um, it makes a great kind of sense of satisfaction in terms of knowing that stuff that I inputted in, in, as as a as a total clueless user uh, of, of the building knowing that what, what, what I've done and what I've, what I've spoken to has been implemented and has been taken on board by my own colleague Lee McMoney when I was out there at the moment. He was an evangelist for our, uh, our building in terms of its universal design. So it was, it was great to meet with Liam and be asked to, uh, to participate in this and, and be, a, be a user. So I'll just uh, get to my last slide, please, Terry. And just, just again, just listen. Thanks very much for for your attention, and it's 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 a it's a pleasure to have be, to be asked to, to do this and, and to talk about the, the North Wall Key Building. It's it's a, it's it's a pleasure to work in there too, and it's a, it's a real sense of of belonging and, and inclusiveness. Um, before I finish, I am um, I'd just like to say that it's it was a real honour to to hear and 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 what what the uh, what the crew before lunch had to say, and particularly you want to pay tribute to Emma, who's starting out in her career as a as a person with disability, and it's. Um, you know, it's it's a real it's a real good news story. It's real it's a real um, you know, it's a, it's it's a it's a it's a product of this stuff working well. So I wish Emma very very well in her career. And I'll finish up there by saying now they're going to roll a little bit of a video of the of the e-learning module which has just been launched. So thank you very much for your attention, everybody. I mean, I've, I've, I've had a disability all my life, effectively. So, you know, it's it's always in, in, in the back of your mind that, you know, maybe accessing things is different and maybe, you know, the way I use my technology is slightly different. But 
to work in an environment which is so accessible and so usable um, like this, it kind of it kind of enables me to not have to consider my disability in any way. I think it, it, there's an awful lot of kind of smaller factors which all contribute and work together to, to become um, a sort of a one very, very accessible, very, very usable uh, environment. And to me, an accessible and user, usable environment means, you know, where I don't actually have to think about the fact that I, I can't see or the fact that I might, you know, you know, walk into something or I might, you know, not, not be able to find something. So the, the reason why the building works is that it's accessibility and usability for everybody. Um, there's an awful lot of contributing factors to the accessibility and the usability of the building. All right, I'm not sure if we have time for questions. One online, one online question. So uh, thank you for being patient with us in terms of, it's such an interesting topic. Um, so, but we'll take a question and, you know, everyone is available, as they said, to connect either, you know, in the afternoon or even online, I'm sure, uh, to answer any more questions. So we will take that one question, whoever has it. Okay. Uh, Sorry to everybody else that I'm going to have to leave out, but uh, so there's a question for Selena, and it's about the level of un universal design that was used in the Valhalla housing project in Clondalkin. The question is, was it UD plus or UD plus plus? Oh, I actually don't have that answer, um, but I could find out for you uh, that if you if you want to leave your uh, contact detail. But I'm sorry, I. I I'm I'm not an architect, and I I, I don't know which it was, but I, I can say that you know it's it is really uh, very accessible, very wide doors, level space. Um, it's it's wonderful, and the feedback from those who have access needs, who are some of the residents or tenants in it, has been extremely extremely positive. So from a functional functionality. It has certainly been a, a success, but I'm sorry, I'm not sure which category it falls into. Well, listen, thank you so much, Terry, and uh, to all our panel members, uh, Claire, Katie, Tony and Selena. That was all fascinating, as I know you'll agree. And I'm sorry we had to be so ruthless in terms of the questions. Um, but uh, as I say, we'll try and get back to as many of them as possible uh, as we can in the future weeks. Um, so we now have time for another break. Um, I'm going to ask if we could try and make it a 10 minute break so that we could uh, in, squeeze in a couple of questions at the end of the next session as well. Uh, so if we're at 1500 now, so 10 past three, if you wouldn't mind. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>